but it it always came to a resolution that we always move forward. And so one of the things that I think of is that, you know, in the movie Star Wars, the force, you know, there's the force out there. And I believe that the force that has helped us has been our Lakota chiefs. And I have a picture that my son has done of four great uh, Lakota chiefs. And they're all related to my wife, Darlene. And <clears throat> that's Little Wound. Little Wound, her uh, great grandmother was uh, Little Wound's sister, and she, and she married Henry Chaplin. The other one is Young Man Afraid of His Horses, which is uh, Darlene's uh, grandpa was Frank Afraid of His Horses. And then there's Red Pop. <clears throat> And uh, I think they're out there, you know, for all the years that we went through kind of, you know, struggling times. I think these chiefs in that force that's out there says, we're going to help Oglala Lakota College be a great institution. So it wasn't just me, it was that force. And the fourth chief that's in that picture that my, my son has, and actually my grandson <clears throat> is named after him. His name is... Uh, Jack, uh, Jack Red Cloud, uh, Jack Red Cloud, and so uh, that kind of historical connection that we have to our our people is really important. I think. Tom, along those lines, in the beginning of the college, there was a commitment made that any person who graduated from Oglala Coast College would have 15 hours of Lakota studies. And I remember in the beginning that, although the college made that commitment, there was a debate about that amongst some community and some people sued the college, but why do we need to take Lakota studies in that? And, but that's the way it was in the beginning. Today, when you say overall Lakota college, that Lakota part really is a strong part of what students go through at the college. Talk a little bit about that, that commitment to Lakota studies that the college has had. Well, you know, <clears throat> there's only like maybe a handful of, of the tribal college, right, Diné College, Sinte, <clears throat> and OLC, that has placed that heavy emphasis. And because our founders said, we're gonna provide the academic credentials for people to get jobs on the reservation or if they wanted to go off, such as uh, teachers, uh, nurses, one, one of our most fantastic programs, along with nursing and uh, <clears throat> the uh, social work program that we have. Um, and we have all of them, all of our degree offerings are exceptional, but the, <clears throat> the most effective degrees that have placed people into really good uh, high paying jobs have been uh, these three that I've just mentioned. <clears throat> but Lakota perspective, uh, our elders wanted our students to know who they were. You know, because basically the white men took our, uh, <clears throat> you know, tried to basically do away with our cultural beliefs. And so there was <clears throat> almost a a loss, a tremendous loss of the knowledge of the cultures. And, and through the years, uh, to me, a, a great example of is Pete fills a pipe. You know, I remember when I came back, and Lakota, Lang, uh, Lakota song and dance class. And, and he now has become a, a spiritual leader and some of the songs that he probably learned came out of that uh, Lakota song and dance class that he took. And, <clears throat> but the thing that is, uh, is uh, validates what our uh, founding fathers had is we had a focus visit and you go through um, kind of getting ready for it. And we invited the <clears throat> uh, South Dakota State University to come down and do a kind of a practice uh, visit for the Higher Learning Commission to kind of get us ready. And so they met with students and they 
uh, <clears throat> the people from SDSU said, well, you know, it's going to take you at least uh, another half year or year to get your college degree because of those 15 additional credit hours. And so do you think the college had done at Gerald Onefeather and Geraldine Janice, Elma Jacobs, and uh, Rogers from Bob Lee, and uh, well, she was uh, one of our first uh, teachers with the college. Patty Twist, Patty Twist. Those were the five founding, founding members. And they sure set a good direction for our institution. I appreciate what they've done for us. We're visiting with Tom Shortbull. You're listening to Kiwi FM Radio. We're looking back on Tom's 31 years as president of Oglala Coach College. He has he has turned in his resignation. He will. It's not a resi retire retirement. Resignation is a little bit different. Excuse me. He has turned in his retirement papers and formally will retire in July. Tom, uh, obviously. And, and I see this every year when graduation comes out and there's a press release and I know your words are in there and talking about what the college is all about. It's talking about graduates, whether they're students getting a certificate in Lakota language or whether getting an associate degree, um, say an associate degree in nursing or an associate degree in applied science whether it be automotive technology or construction or any number of the bachelor's degrees and now even today a master's degree. But you talk about the graduates and talk about that. That's every year as you watch the graduates come up and get their degree, um, you think back to what it has meant to their life and that. When you look you back know, over your 31 yeah. years, that's a lot of graduates. What's it meant to you? Well, you know, I think, <clears throat> you know, we I've had a lot of accomplishments. Uh, the college has and, and under my leadership. And one of the things that I'm proud of is the amount of uh, scholarship support that we're going, that we are currently giving to our students and we'll give to them down the road. It's going to be a pretty substantial amount of money. Right now, I think our last uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, accounting that we had, we had $37 million in scholarships for our students. Those are really uh, good accomplishments, but you know what? The most important accomplishment is our graduates. And I am so proud of our graduates because uh, they go out to have really successful careers. I mean, you look at a Marjorie Murdoch that uh, was the director of nursing for the Pine Ridge Hospital. You look at, um, Frescus, uh, Danny Frescus, who's now uh, <clears throat> the assistant area director for the uh, <clears throat> Bureau of Indian Affairs. And, you know, I could just keep going on, but our nursing graduates, I'm, my wife was a registered nurse, and <clears throat> I know what she's meant to our, our family is that uh, we'll, in a few minutes ago, that I left the college for 16 years. And my wife was the big, basically the breadwinner for our family for close to uh, 20, 20, 20 some years. And <clears throat> the other thing is that, um, so they, <clears throat> our graduates have been just fantastic knowing that we've, uh, <clears throat> we've helped to produce people who could go on into the fields that I, I, I mentioned, uh, <clears throat> business graduates, uh, I think in the uh, tribal fiscal office, there is one of our graduates that right now I just can't remember his name, but you, no matter where you go, you can run, run into um, these uh, graduates. And <clears throat> the thing through the years that has been uh, the most uh, gratifying is to know a student who may have had uh, a drinking problem and then they decided to hey, I'm going to change my life and I'm going to go to OLC. When you see that student as a president coming up that line, you know what they've gone through and you shake their hand and you just get this big lump in your throat. I mean, it's just, uh, <clears throat> it's just wonderful. Uh, and, you know, and we have also people who suffer from 
uh, <clears throat> physical violence as women, uh, having to, uh, like that. one of the other stories is it just goes to show what our students have to go through is, and then our nursing graduates, uh, I'll, I'll get back to this other student, but the nursing graduates, uh, I went to the clinic in uh, Kyle and I was talking to one of our nursing graduates. And it, this is still the craziest rule that I've ever heard in my life is that IHS, who are basically four year degree uh, <clears throat> nursing advocates, require our students to not immediately be hired by IHS. So they have to go work at Monument Health or Rapid City Regional Health for one year before they can be considered for employment. I think the Tribal Council needs to take that up as an action item that our graduates from our nursing program, which are some of the best graduates across the nation, have to wait one year to get employment with IHS. And she said when she was at Monument Health, <clears throat> they would have to go through um, training uh, pro, um, training to improve their skills. And when they would have the tests, almost all of the uh, <clears throat> uh, OLC nursing graduates just aced the tests. And some of these students who, who came from four-year degree granting colleges, <clears throat> uh, they, uh, they didn't do as well. And <clears throat> I've been, always been a strong advocate, not only uh, for OLC, C, but uh, statewide. At one point in time, the president of the University of South Dakota wanted to do away with the nursing program at the University of South Dakota. His name was President McFadden. He felt that he wanted USD, USD to be the Harvard of the Midwest. And so he decided to phase out USD's nursing program. Uh, I was able, uh, through an effort, principally on my part, to get that nursing program saved by an action <clears throat> of the legislature. But <clears throat> the situation with my wife, when she was a registered nurse at <clears throat> uh, St. Mary's Hospital, there was a sister, Helen, she had a choice to send off uh, a, a person to, I think it was in uh, Omaha, Omaha, Nebraska, to take up ICU, you know, uh, emergency care training. And she had a choice between two nurses. And both of them were, were uh, uh, Indian. Uh, it was my wife, Darlene, and Bruce Badmacheson. I don't know if you ever heard of him, a pretty good basketball player at uh, South Dakota uh, <clears throat> School of Mines. But the nurse, <clears throat> the director of nursing, Sister Helen, pick my wife, Darlene. So my wife asked her, she said, why did you pick me? She said the nurses that come out of the University of South Dakota's nursing program get the ground running and they end up almost all of the time being better nurses than the four-year graduates. So our two-year nursing program is another one of those things that I personally take great pride in. Our whole reservation should take pride in those nurses that we are producing. Tom, um, uh, today I, I see, as I see you're sitting in your office, and it's uh, the, at the P.L. Wachoni building. It's at Three Mile Creek um, back in, in the mid, mid to late 70s. Um, there was um, some money to build a new uh, tribal headquarters and a new uh, tribal council building. And uh, uh, I think there's a, it was seven circles and there was a Powell grounds in there too. But what I'm getting at is at that point, somewhere in there in 78, and I know it was 80 when we moved in there, but in 78, they basically gave this building that you've been in since 1980, they gave it to Ogallo Kota College. And what I want to get at is what's the, been the relationship between the college and the Ogallo Sioux tribe? Has it been a good relationship? Is it an important relationship? Well, you know, I mean, it's like being in a marriage. Sometimes you have some disagreements, but uh, for <laughs> the most part, I think that the tribe has been a real asset to Oglala Lakota College. First, they, they chartered them. And then when there was a, uh, 
And when Tom Allen puts in for these proposals, many times they want a letter of support from the chairman of the Oglala Sioux tribe. We've always got a, gotten these letters of support. So that, that's been critical, uh, the support from our tribe. But in regards to Pio Choni, uh, it's something that I take pride in uh, because the history of the Piawe Choni building, that there was a Department of um, Economic Development with the federal government, gave money because Al Trimble was a bureau employee and had a lot of connections, and he got this big grant. And Dennis Sunroads was commissioned to be not only the architect for this building out here, but each of all of the district buildings. And <clears throat> so uh, this area out here, uh, Three Mile Creek, uh, they call it, was uh, going to be the tribal, they were going to move the tribal headquarters from Pine Ridge. Those of us that are older probably remember that you're in, but the younger people probably don't even have a clue as to what happened as to how uh, OLC got this building, Piawe Choni. This Piawe Choni building would have been the tribal headquarters for the There's a referendum vote, and in the referendum vote, it was defeated to move the tribal headquarters from Pine Ridge to Kyle. And then this building became available to for the first person to get in there and ask the tribe to turn that over to uh, uh, one of the tribal organizations of the reservation. Fortunately, uh, we got in first and uh, the tribe in 1978 turned over the uh, building to the college. I think right now uh, we have a 25 year lease. I, I'm, I would also encourage the tribe to just make a uh, permanent lease or a 99 year lease instead of these 25 years we have to go through, I think. Um, we've proven, we've proven ourselves that we are a successful entity. And I would hope that maybe the tribal council could agree to give us a longer term, either lease or permanently uh, transfer that ownership of that land to the, the college. Uh, so the tribe, it, it, it's still has uh, uh, influence with us because the land that we sit on is uh, tribal land. Okay, Tom, um, I can I can't imagine that as you grew up yourself, that you set your goal out to be president of Oglala Lakota College. Tell me a little bit about the early years of Tom Shortbull and and where you started and how you ended up as president of Oglala Coach College. Well, you know, it's, it's really ironic uh, <clears throat> that my mother would always tell me his name was Henry Prue and he got, uh, <clears throat> his lungs got burned out because he was at Igloo and they were throwing these bomb uh, casings around and it opened up and uh, he didn't have a mask on and uh, this was uh, mustard gas and went directly into his lungs. But <clears throat> we used to always go up and visit him because we had to be close to um, Susan. And <clears throat> I must have been four, or maybe four or five years old. And my mom always uh, told me the story. There must have been something about me that he saw something in me. He said, you know, this young man could be president of the United States. Well. I didn't end up being president of the United States, but I'm, I take great pride that I am I'm the president of the Oglala Lakota College. And, <clears throat> you know, through the years, uh, you know, you would think that someone who's had my successes would have had, you know, just uh, almost a straight line on a chart of all successes and no uh, <clears throat> failures. but. Uh, I've gone through some really hard times. Uh, I remember my parents were educated at St. Francis Indian School, and those nuns uh, <clears throat> taught their students to, to any, wherever, any place that they went, that they should be the best, that they, they get the best education. My wife, I mean, my mother was uh, 
exceptional student was at the top of her class and should have gotten the scholastic award. But the, the priest, who was Father Collins, said uh, <clears throat> she didn't have good deportment. Well, the good deportment means you didn't pay attention to class and all of this stuff. So she didn't get the scholastic award, but she went on to Haskell Indian School, uh, then, now it's called a, a university or a college, and uh, she took their uh, secretarial training and she passed the civil service exam. To this day, I, I don't know too many people who, who passed the civil service exam. It was a really tough, tough test. And so my, my parents were here to be uh, by the uh, St. Francis School to be successful people. And that was the case. Uh, uh, my mother uh, uh, worked at the Panama Canal Zone uh, right before World War II, delivered mail at the White House. Uh, my dad was uh, <coughs> learned uh, drafty at St. Francis and was a draftsman for the Bureau of Indian Affairs on the Rosebud Reservation. And he was really a hard worker. Uh, some of the signs, uh, I don't know if you remember, uh, <clears throat> there was a sign up there by the um, um, National Guard in Rapid City, um, Bobtail Inn, or it was something like that. So he would make, <clears throat> In addition, because you know there was 10, 10 children in our family, and he had to take outside jobs, so he was always painting houses for somebody, making signs, and uh, the real <clears throat> uh, kind of uh, heartwarming thing that's happened to me is my son uh, decided to <clears throat> to uh, <clears throat> own a sign shop, but <clears throat> a, a customer came in and he said, uh, "Your name is Shortbow." And he said, yeah, he said, I knew a short bull. Uh, one day I saw him work on a sign. You know where the old Safeway is? They used to have the Prairie Market in that kind of that area there. Uh, and there's uh, <clears throat> a building uh, on the north side in that kind of complex there. He said, your dad worked the whole day uh, putting that sign and getting that sign done. And so... Uh, it just goes to show you that my parents were hard workers. And, um, <clears throat> but what happened is when my, uh, when, um, after they married and they worked at Igloo, like it was the period of relocation. And my dad wanted to go to the Denver art school to get a training as, uh, as an artist. <clears throat> and so, my mother worked for the relocation office in, in Denver. And <clears throat> one, one year, uh, I think it was 1951, my dad got a call from, uh, from Wombly and they said that his uncle, his, uh, his name was like mine, Tom Shortfall, uh, <clears throat> was really sick and they, I think they feared that he was going to die. So. My dad said, hey, we're going back to Wombly. So we went back to Wombly. And one of the things that I always remember is that they were having a powwow. And they knew that we had come in from Denver. And they gave us a, a buffalo, buffalo blanket. And I can tell you, uh, living in, in, in that period, 1951, would be the warmest thing you could ever have would, would be a buffalo blanket that really kept you warm. But we really struggled financially from 51 through 56. And uh, I remember a time uh, we moved to Belvedere because the banker wanted uh, my dad. He was a, a clarinetist, played the clarinet. And uh, there was, uh, they said they'd always have work for him. But uh, <clears throat> we were poor. We were really poor. I always make this comment to my, I made this comment to my wife. I said, you know, when we, my mother was really a good cook. I mean, she could make bread. She learned that from her and mom. And uh, and I said, but most of the time we had potato soup. And she, my wife said, yeah, I like the potato soup when you put some bacon or ham in it. I said, you guys had bacon and ham. We never had bacon. It was just plain old potato soup. 
And so if people think today that my life has just been one series of successes, uh, don't know that I, I, I went through some hard times. And then there's a, a baseball story that I always tell. And I was playing second base. Uh, I was, uh, wasn't a starter, but we played a double hitter. So I went out and started the game at second. And the base runner was on first base and he was going to steal second base. And the catcher threw a, uh, <clears throat> a throw to second, but it was probably 20, 15 to 20 feet high. There was no way in heck that I was going to be able to catch that ball. I would have had to go into the baseline, jump up. And when I came down, if he slid in, I probably would have wrecked my legs. The, the coach, uh, seeing that play, and he had these long legs, he came, came, in out, he came out to walk it really fast, and he said, you're out of here. Don't you have any moxie? He said it really loud. In fact, he said it about four walking to me, he said, don't you have any moxie? Well, moxie means, do you have, don't you have any guts? You don't, and I always remember going back to the uh, <clears throat> benches where we, we sat. I sat on uh, the left-hand side and I looked down at the other players. None of them would look at me. They, they looked straight ahead. Uh, the next year I, uh, <clears throat> I was the starting third base uh, <clears throat> for our team. And I had the weakest arm you could ever see. It was almost like throwing from third to first, like a center fielder throwing to home. So the coach said, throw it as hard as you can to first base, and we got a good first baseman, and <clears throat> he'll, he'll catch it. So <clears throat> I, I started the season, and um, we really had a good season. And what happened is <clears throat> I broke my nose, and at the Edgemont field, they had these big rocks, really big rocks, and they'd hit the rocks and they'd go one way or the other. You never knew which way they were going to go. And finally, one of the balls that was hit to me came straight up and made a C in my nose. And so I had to get that fixed. And my first practice back, we were getting ready for the state tournament, which we won. Uh, <clears throat> we had a rundown play between third and first. And uh, so the catcher threw me the ball before I could, uh, the next thing I would do would touch the base runner. And the base runner, instead of just letting me uh, tag him, took his arms and went straight into me and went up, broke my nose again. So <clears throat> I think the coach realized that I did have some moxie. And one of the best things that ever happened most exhilarating thing that said one of the most exhilarating things that happened to me was uh, <clears throat> I was made I was I was named to the alternate team and then the coach named two players to go up and accept the trophy. I was one of them. I was really not the top two players on the team, but what it showed was is that if you hang in there and you keep working at something that attitude that, that I had no moxie was replaced with uh, my coach uh, having a lot of admiration for me. And then there was another incident with this coach, which goes to show you how white people think of us, is after I concluded my teenager season, uh, <clears throat> I, I had a, they expected me to play for the Legion team. That, that's what I would have been 16. And so uh, they had an officer's club and my mom and dad went up there to, um, to go to the dance. And so the, this, his name was Digger Odell. I guess there's a book that was written about uh, a guy named Odell. His first name was Royal, Royal Odell. And he asked my dad, um, is Tom going to play Legion ball this, this year? And he said, no, I think he decided to sit out a year and see if he can find some work. I never did find any work at Eagle uh, during that summer. And he said, you know, uh, Tom will probably end up like a lot of our ball players, I mean, uh, Indian ball players at Eagle that uh, were really good athletes, but ended up with drinking problems. And my dad's got so ticked off that they got into major pushing, pushing match. But that's the attitude that white people had have about us. 
is that the way that they can justify what they did in taking our lands through manifest destiny is that they've got to come up with a conclusion that we are not as capable as white people. And they always use the drunk thing against us. You know, uh, he's okay, but he really uh, drinks a lot and all of that. So, uh, <clears throat> so I, I <clears throat> went after I uh, left Eagle to go to, we moved to Rapid and then I got my degree at USD and was a legislator. <clears throat> I went to a, a reunion of the Igloo people, and <clears throat> this coach called me over, and it was the most uh, impressive thing I've, I've had in my life, because this coach was so pleased to, uh, he was, he was happy he was, he was so impressed with my accomplishments that he just had this beaming smile on his face. He was happy to see me. And it just goes again to show you that what initially was kind of a negative thing is that if you hang in there, uh, a good things can happen to you. And, and I think that's been my career with uh, the college. I didn't want to leave the college and uh, <clears throat> In 1979, uh, there was some office politics that led to me having to leave because uh, <clears throat> it had become pretty much an unbearable type of situation, uh, kind of people undermining me. I, so <clears throat> I left the college 16 years. Can you imagine those 16 years? I did have some uh, good positions, but during that period, I was semi-unemployed. Out of the 16 years, I probably uh, <clears throat> only brought in three, three to four years of, of a, a yearly salary. I, during all of that time, I was an adjunct faculty member. Uh, my wife said I was depressed half the time because, uh, you know, I, I, I didn't like my situation where I didn't was it was not uh, helping with the financial needs of our family. And, <clears throat> and I actually put in for the president in 1991. Uh, <clears throat> and me and Jim Wilson uh, <clears throat> put in for the uh, president's position. We both came in suits. Uh, the other candidate came in and did the old farmer bib, uh, overhauls. <clears throat> and uh, but then it finally turned around and, and uh, I, I put in for the, when the position came open again and, uh, and I got the position and I owe a huge debt of gratitude to those uh, board members and the ones that I'd like to point, point out most who were there with us, with me the longest would be uh, <clears throat> Newton Cummings, uh, Dennis Brewer, Pete Redwillow and uh, Phoebe Tallman uh, through my 31 years. And they were always there to support me. Um, the other uh, <clears throat> situation is that um, I lost my train of thought there. But anyway, uh, you know, I, oh, the, the two Conroy. Uh, Tom Conroy and uh, Chuck Conroy were also a good support by the way during the early years of my presidency. So, hey Tom, let's. Um, one thing I want to ask you about: um, we had a debate at the college at one time. Um, we had seen over the years a number of people move from Pine Ridge from Roosevelt, from Cheyenne River to Rapid City. So there was a growing native community in Rapid. And there were calls for, why doesn't Ogallala Coach College have a center in Rapid? And I know that the debate raged at the college. Well, we were built for the, for the reservation, not Rapid City. But it was an extension center, and it grew into a full-blown center. 
talk about that because we've not only the college has not only expanded to Rapid City, but also the Shine River as well. And how did that fit into the mission of the college from your perspective? Well, we have to go wherever the Lakota people are. And in Rapid City, there's a large Pine Ridge population. It, does, it made common sense that we would uh, that we would have a center there, but we were always uh, giving uh, the least uh, effective type of facilities there. For a while, we were at, uh, I think, the Methodist Church we, uh, in Rapid City. Then we went to Mother Butler. And I always, I taught at Mother Butler uh, for, for many years uh, when they had it on the first floor. I don't know if you ever taught classes up there. Tom, did you uh, teach classes up there in Rapid? When it was at the Mother Butler Center? Yeah. Yes, yes. You know, there were their offices. You'd go in and you'd turn to the right and uh, there was uh, like a, a quarter of off offices going uh, down the right side. And I always remember I had to go in and turn my grades in. And there was an understanding with the Catholic Church that if there was uh, something that came up that the Catholic Church needed to use those office spaces. And so I was going back to give my grades and I looked off to the right side and there was uh, a casket there. They were having a wake. I mean, how many, how many college centers in this country would you have a, a wake service in one of the classes where students were still being involved with things? But that was another major decision that I made that I, um, I really, uh, I'm, I'm really proud of. There was basically a mentality within the college that uh, Rapid City was an extension center and they should not have their own college center. Uh, I made it a priority to have a college center up there. Uh, one of the uh, one of the uh, college centers, uh, some of the local board members objected to what I was doing and they took me before the tribal council. And I'm appreciative that the tribal council supported my position on the, the need to have uh, a center up there. And again, that goes back to what a strong working relationship that we, that we had. And so that college center has now become <clears throat> uh, with Pine Ridge, the, the largest college centers that we have. And so all of the income that Rapid City College Center uh, produces in uh, <clears throat> PL 471 funding is really uh, <clears throat> the college centers on the reservation are the beneficiary of having that center up there because we have more income. So uh, it's one of the decisions that I've been really proud of that uh, Rapid City, and it's, it's, it's beneficial to the entire reservation because the money that Rapid City generates helps our smaller centers. Tom, when you, you have spent 31 years here, Oglala Cliffs College as president, you're retiring. You're going to retire in July. It's 2022. When you look ahead to the future of Oglala Cliffs College, what are the challenges that you see ahead? for the college, both challenges and areas that you you see the college continuing to develop in? Well, you know, one of the things that uh, the Head Start uh, uh, director for, uh, that's in charge of our, uh, our college, our uh, Head Start program on the reservation, wanted to have one of these meetings within Head Start where they, they wanted me to talk about uh, about Indian things, and so I took a a <clears throat> and dealt with all the atrocities that were committed against us as Indian people, and <clears throat> so that goes back to the uh, King War, where they uh, <clears throat> they had these prayer town Indians that uh, they were. Uh, the pilgrims would talk these uh, <clears throat> these this tribe that was uh, in that area to come into the uh, white towns and be prayer town Indians. It was a way of assimilating us, and but the requirement is that you had to be yet to take up the Christian faith. So when King Philip made a attack 
on the pilgrims uh, in uh, the 1600s. Uh, and they attacked some farmhouses and some of the towns. And once the, it was called King Philip's War, the, the colonists prevailed. But what they did there is they rounded up all these prayer town Indians. They put them on a boat and took them to an uninhabitable island. And they, most of them, I would say, uh, out of uh, maybe 99% of them died on that island because they weren't given any food or anything. I mean, that's, that's a terrible atrocity. Wounded knee is a terrible atrocity. Uh, <clears throat> The Chivantine Massacre, the Sand Creek Massacre, all are atrocities, but the most <clears throat> interesting one, and I had hoped to uh, bring up that document, in, in California, they've now come across uh, of this, uh, one of the law schools was named after this guy that was uh, really a rich man through uh, gold discovery, and they found out that they actually hunted Colorado Indians as if it was a fox hunt. They track them down and kill them. And what makes it so unusual is that they were, <clears throat> were able to get reimbursed for the cost of hunting down Indians in California. And, <clears throat> um, and so now the effort is to rename the law school for someone other than this, this man and these are terrible atrocities, but do you know what? <clears throat> Hitler saw what America had done to its Indians. There was massive research on what America had done to its Indians. And so uh, I think it's called Lebensraum, the whole idea that uh, Germany needed more land, uh, that that justification was the same as manifest destiny. And basically getting rid of Indians because there were millions of people in America, they used that to get rid of the Jews and the Eastern Europeans. Now we are moving <clears throat> to a state where that could happen again. We have these rights, white supremacists in this country are we going to go back to a period where we are hunted down like the California Indians? And actually, there were probably periods in which we were hunted down. I had this uh, friend that worked for the Rapid City Fire Department. Remember all the deaths that were occurring in Rapid Creek? They were finding them face down. Uh, there's a good possibility the white supremacists were involved in killing those Indians. Uh, are we going to have to worry about being hunted down as, and so <clears throat> we all know what I'm talking about, the, the possibility that Trump could get in again and the white supremacists would take control of this country. Will the Jews, will the blacks, will the Hispanics, will the American Indian be hunted down? And they're always talking about we need a, <clears throat> a second uh, civil war. Um, so we've got some, <laughs> Right now, I, I think what we need to do, uh, we got to continue working to always improve ourselves as an institution, do whatever we can for our students. But there's a greater danger out there right now, and that's the, the potential for a second Donald Trump presidency. And if he gets in there, he'll, I'm afraid that he'll do the same things that, that uh, Hitler do, did in Nazi Germany. And uh, so it's a scary time to me. Well, Tom, uh, 31 years, it's a lot to look over. A lot has happened, a lot has evolved and developed. Anything you want to say in closing? Well, I just want to thank our students. I'm, I'm always so proud of them. Um, they hang in there, you know. Uh, people don't realize that um, things happen with our students. Uh, a parent may die, they may, may lose a child, they have to stop out. Uh, it normally doesn't take our students uh, <clears throat> the normal time period. Sometimes it takes them eight, ten. And, you know, when Obama got in as president, he really made a, 
what I think was one of the most disastrous decisions that we could have made. And, and this whole idea that you have to get graduated within uh, four, to, four to five years. And so there's funding for uh, minority people or for those that get financial aid under Pell has been really reduced. <clears throat> and I saw this uh, Parade Magazine. I don't know if you get the Sunday uh, paper with the Rap City Journal. And they, <clears throat> they had this article in the, about an actor. He said, it took me eight years because it took me that long to figure out what, eight to 10 years, it took me that long to find out what I could really be good at. And um, so I really dislike that we are always under the pressure to graduate our students within what has now become Obama uh, time frame that you got to get your degree within four to six years. And uh, I think it's the worst thing that ha has happened to minority institutions. Uh, <clears throat> and, you know, the thing that's important uh, <clears throat> is if people have an opportunity to go to college, there'll be less of a, a situation where those students will get in trouble with the law and things like that. To me, investing in minority students by the federal government is uh, it's the top of the list of what they should be doing. Because I always remember there was a student <clears throat> at Kyle, we, we built an addition there. And so I asked him this question. I said, how do you like the, the new addition? He said, I like it and I like going to school at OLC because I feel safe here, safe. And I think uh, our college centers are like sacred places uh, they can go there feel safe get their education but anytime <clears throat> white america is now saying you have to graduate people from four to six years i think it's just ludicrous and you know how i am i've always expressed my opinion and that there has to be more latitude given to the minority serving institutions because of where our students are at you know grandma dies or there's an illness and it takes them longer because they have to stop off to take care of family business. And it, it's, it's just something that I, there are things that I dislike about what occurs in the nation. And this is one of them, this whole emphasis that we have to get people graduated somewhere between four and six years. I, I don't think it's right. So that's it, Tom. Uh Okay. Well, Tom, I thank you very much. Well, well Tom, I can I you. say one more thing before we go? Sure. You know, what, what year did you come here? Come, you mean to find your interest over Oklahoma Coach College? To the reservation. I came for a year or two in 1970 and never left. 1970. So you got more years than me. You should, you should, there should be a celebration of your life, Tom Casey, because <laughs> I really, I really, I really mean it. I'm not trying to BS you is that, uh, <clears throat> you know, uh, you know, you and I had a difference is because you never would get things in on time with our uh, annual reports, but some of those annual reports were just fantastic, Tom. And then to take over Keeley Radio, and uh, my mother-in-law was a big fan of yours. She'd call you uh, Overtime Casey because uh, I didn't I, I didn't listen to a lot of games. But once it got close, I think you would say, "Looks like overtime, guys. Looks like overtime." But what you've done for this reservation, not only broadcasting games and interviewing people, uh, you are a major asset to this reservation, Tom and I. I want to tip my hat and congratulate you for all the hard work that you've done through the years. Thank you, Tom. I thank you for all the work and commitment you made to Oglala Coach College, the impact that you had not only on the college, but the entire Oglala Coach Nation, and for that matter, the American Indian Higher Education Consortium, the series of tribal colleges across this country. I think Oglala Coach College, uh, through some of your leadership, be, is a leader in the tribal setting the tone for where we have gone and where we need to go. I thank you for sharing today. I wish you the best between now and July. 
and I wish you the best in your retirement. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, Tom. You've been listening to an interview with Tom Shortbull, who is president of Ogala Coach College. He is retiring. His last days will be in July after spending 31 years as president. You've been listening to Keeley FM Radio, the voice of this great Lakota nation. Uh, coming up, we went a little bit long, but coming up is Dana Brabeagle with Tribal Education Agency. For Keeley News and Public Affairs, this is Tom Casey. We'll turn it back over to the...